Um, so thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to listen tonight. Um, this is um, one of four in a series on joints. And this one is, it's not too late to save your joints. If you can go, you'll see at the top of the screen, um, menti.com and use the code that's there, 59072372. And um, because we are gonna have some interaction. However, with this small group, it may not be as important, but anyway, we'll get started. Next slide, please. So um, this um, talk tonight is, as you know, being presented on behalf of um, NHF and the National Hemophilia Foundation. I'm not gonna read this, you guys can see this, but it is de dedicated to finding cures for inherited bleeding disorders. And um, also looking at the complications, the research and education for patients with um, bleeding disorders. Next slide, please. So keep in mind, whatever you hear here is um, only information. It is not medical advice and you need to contact your healthcare provider um, if you have questions or concerns regarding joint disease um, or anything you hear in this particular talk tonight. Next slide, please. So with that, we'll talk about the objectives. Um, we're gonna talk about identifying joint bleeds knowing how to prevent joint bleeding and how to address joint bleeds when they do happen. Next slide. So we're gonna do a little icebreaker and with um, everyone here. So next slide. So there are a lot of different sensations you or your child may experience when they get a bleed. And some of those that have been reported have been things like tingling or a bubbly feeling. Some um, patients describe it as an aura. They can tell it's getting ready to happen. Um, a little bit later down the, the line, patients will um, complain of throbbing or pain. And that throbbing is because there's blood entering the joint and there's not space. Our bodies didn't design space in those joints for, for blood. Um, a late sign is heat or warmth and swelling, and then difficulty moving the joint. And so if you are a parent or a caregiver, um, you also can participate in this um, exercise. Next slide, please. So just type in um, into Mentimeter um, what sensations you do feel when you get a bleed or what your um, family member has mentioned to you when you get a bleed. And again, you have to go to mentimeter.com and use the code at the top of the slide. Okay, so we will go on to the next slide, please. And so we're gonna talk about what actually is going on in your joint when you have a joint bleed and um, the joint damage that results from that bleed. Next slide. So we're gonna watch a short YouTube, it's about four minutes long, I think, um, that talks a little bit about um, joint disease and bleeding disorders. So if Natalia, you could start the video, that would be great. If you have a bleeding disorder, it's important to know that most bleeds are not caused by a cut. You can also bleed inside the body, in a muscle, Mucosal lining like a nosebleed or a joint. A joint bleed can occur from an injury or can occur spontaneously. This means it can happen without an obvious cause. The joints that are most affected by bleeds are knees, elbows, ankles, hips, and shoulders. When bleeds happen often in the same joint, this becomes known as a target joint. Frequent bleeds to one target joint can cause serious damage. It may be difficult to tell if a bleed has started you may not be able to see any signs when a joint bleed begins, but you may notice that something does not seem right. You may feel bubbling or tingling in the joint, 
Your joint may also start to feel warm and you may have a hard time moving it. As the bleed becomes worse, blood pools into the joint. Eventually, your joint will feel hot, painful, and swollen. Over time, the amount of blood in your joint may cause increased pressure within the joint and may severely limit your movement. Many people who have a bleeding disorder follow a prophylactic treatment plan, called PROFI for short. PROFI is when you take clotting factor infusions to prevent a bleed. Clotting factor can also be used during a bleed and is best if done early. The longer you wait to infuse clotting factor during a bleed, the longer it will take for your joint to work normally, especially if a lot of blood has pooled into the joint. You may need to infuse more than once for a bleed. Once a joint bleed has started, giving clotting factor will stop the bleed by helping the blood to clot. The clotting factor does not remove the blood that has already collected in the joint. But over time, the blood in the joint is absorbed. After treating a bleed with factor, some healthcare providers recommend rice, rest, ice, compression, and elevation. Every time a joint bleed happens, it damages your joint. Joint bleeds can cause damage to the joint lining, and eventually this may lead to damage of the cartilage around the joint. The cartilage is a part of the joint that covers and cushions the bones to allow the bones to move smoothly. Frequent bleeds can wear out parts of the cartilage. This can cause the bones to rub together. The rubbing can cause the bones and the joint to change shape and lose its normal function. Once this happens, the joint will become painful and hard to move. If you have a joint bleed, you are more likely to have another bleed in the same joint, creating a target joint in the future. Frequent bleeds in the same area can lead to permanent damage to your joints. This damage can prevent you from doing what you want and need to do. This could mean riding a bike, playing tennis, picking up groceries, working, and doing activities with your family. You may not be able to walk without pain, and in some cases, you may need to use assisted devices. To prevent bleeds, be sure to follow your treatment plan as prescribed by your healthcare provider. You can also follow a physical activity plan that you discuss with your healthcare provider. If you have a bleeding disorder, you may be worried about activities causing a bleed. But what you may not know is that physical activity can actually help prevent joint bleeds by strengthening muscles and helping maintain a healthy body weight. Keep active and maintain a healthy weight for better joint health. It's important to know the early signs of a bleed so that when a bleed happens, any type of bleed, it can be treated and stopped as early as possible. There are various kinds of treatment for different bleeding disorders. If you have questions about bleeds, speak to your hemophilia treatment center team or healthcare provider. For more information about this and other topics, visit stepsforliving.hemophilia.org. Well, that video gave us a good overview of um, what happens when you have a joint bleed. And you guys may be very experienced and know a lot of this. And so it may just be repetitive. Um, but what I'd like to do is just kind of go through some of this. So, and reiterate what our, the video told us. So um, the joints that are most commonly affected um, are the knees, the elbows, and the ankles. But remember, you can bleed in any joint. A joint is any place in the body where two bones come together. So people think about, you know, the big joints like the knees, elbows, and ankles, but also um, things like fingers bleed, um, toes, your back can actually bleed in between the ver vertebral bodies of the, of the back. Um, you can get bleeds in your hip, you can get bleeds um, in your shoulder. So there are a lot of places where we can have bleeds. It's just the elbows, knees, and the ankles are the most common. Um, bleeding usually occurs after a traumatic event um, or some type of trauma, but not always. And um, especially patients who have developed inhibitors really have oftentimes have spontaneous bleeds and bleeds that they don't know 
what caused them. Um, joint bleeding can be spontaneous, especially if someone, if you think back to that video, it talked about um, repetitive bleeding and developing a target joint. If someone has a target joint, then they are more likely to have spontaneous bleeds into that target joint. And you don't always know, um, you're, um, I know Naomi, it looks like you have a son with hemophilia. Um, you don't know that, um, you know, they may not be able to, they're, they're either too young to be able to report that they're having a bleeding episode, or they may not know what actually caused it. Next slide, please. So when a bleed does occur, the, the hallmark is to give factor early. Um, as a hemophilia treatment center nurse, we always encouraged our patients to treat within two hours of recognizing that a bleed is happening. Um, if you are already on Profi, don't wait till your next dose. Um, if you're on emicizumab or hemlibra, um, follow the protocol that your healthcare provider has prescribed for you. If you don't already have um, a plan in place, contact your HTC for recommendations. Um, so don't wait. You don't. I think that's one of the things that we're we may be encountering in patients who are on um, emicizumab is they're not sure if they're having a bleed, so they wait. Um, it won't hurt to give factors. So um, I think um, we should look at getting that treatment in as soon as possible. And then as the video talked about, um, we wanna do rice, um, rest, ice, compression, elevation. Um, and sometimes we call it price, we add protect. So we don't want to do a lot of um, things that, that may damage the joint further or cause re-bleeding. So um, we do want to protect the, the joint. Um, some patients can't tolerate ice. I know I've had several patients who um, are not able to tolerate ice. Sometimes they can tolerate it on their elbow or their knee, but not on their ankle. Sometimes compression can increase pain. So we wanna be careful when we're using compression. And um, I'm just gonna go back to ice for a second. Um, when using ice, you never wanna leave ice, put ice directly on the skin. You always wanna have some barrier in between that ice pack and your skin. It could be a washcloth, a dish towel, um, a gauze pad, anyone, um, any, anything like that to protect your skin from the ice and you don't wanna leave the ice on for longer than 20 minutes. Next slide, please. Um, for those who have severe bleeding, um, you wanna consider prophylaxis, but in this day and time, we don't really just talk about prophylaxis for our patients with severe bleeding disorders. So that's why it says severe bleeding, not severe hemophilia. So. There are patients who have mild hemophilia or von Willebrand's disease um, that do experience joint bleeding, even though the laboratory level is um, says that they're more mild. So what is prophylaxis? Well, it's the regular infusion of, of clotting factor or using a mimetic such as emicizumab um, to prevent bleeding. So we wanna avoid activities that potentially could cause joint bleeds. And really the, the biggest thing that we encourage patients to avoid are the hard contact sports. So things like football, ice hockey, um, boxing, wrestling, um, those things tend to cause joint bleeds even if you are on prophylaxis or using emicizumab. So we wanna um, prevent those bleeds. Now, when you talk to other people within the hemophilia community, you're gonna hear about patients who do participate in those type of sports. And that is with a plan that they have developed with their healthcare provider. So they're not just arbitrarily um, going out and playing football. They're, um, they're developing a plan with their healthcare provider. And um, again, if you have already developed a target joint, um, 
protecting that target joint. So um, you may want to use a protective neoprene sleeve or something like that if you're going to participate in activity when you already know you have um, a target joint. Next slide, please. So what's the, how does this happen? So you have joint bleeding. You may develop a target joint, you may not. But once a target joint develops, then you're going to develop what we call chronic synovitis. So if you look at um, this video or this um, picture, on the left hand side is a normal joint. And um, you can see where synovial membrane is highlighted. And you can see it's a thin membrane that lines the, this in particular is a knee joint, um, that lines the joint. And but what we see is um, in hemophilia is that um, lining of the joint, that synovial membrane um, becomes inflamed and it is actually swollen and becomes hypertrophied. Um, so when we look at what is a target joint, um, these are the joints that with, um, four to six ble or four bleeds in six months. And that was a definition that came out of, um, for those of you who have older children, um, we had a universal data collection study that was done by the CDC. And that was the um, definition that was used for target joint there. If you read a lot of literature or look at a lot of different things, you may see other um, definitions of target joints, but target joint really is the number of, or the joint that takes the most factor infusions in a person. When you have repeated bleeding into a joint, eventually you will develop, um, and this is a picture of osteoarthritis, not very different than hemophilic arthritis, um, where the cartilage thins and you get that bone on bone. Next slide, please. So as I said, um, a target joint is repeated bleeding, four bleeds in a six month time period. And patients can have a target joint, an active target joint, but once they stop bleeding in that joint, um, they still have the damage that has already occurred. Um, when someone does have a target joint or a history of a target joint, the treatment for bleeds in that particular joint is often more aggressive. So your healthcare provider may encourage you to treat more aggressively um, than um, if you didn't ever have a bleed. So, um, or did never have a target joint. So for example, let's, um, let's use the example of a, 18 year old and this 18 year old um, when he was in junior high played a lot of basketball and had a right ankle as a target joint he ended up going on prophylaxis and had very few bleeds um, since going on prophy so he doesn't meet that current definition of a target joint he hasn't had four bleeds in a six month period let alone four bleeds into the same joint but he did have a target joint as a 14 year old so if he were to injure his right ankle then his healthcare providers may treat that joint more aggressively than they would have um, a joint that has had very little bleeding in it next slide please And this is a very dramatic picture of synovitis. Um, this, I'm not sure if this was one of um, our patients who came up from Mexico. I know I have a similar picture of a kiddo with a, a joint like that, but that looks like a grapefruit, not a knee. And what that is, is that swollen inflamed synovial lining. So I showed you where that lining was on the previous um, slide and now you can see what happens. With appropriate treatment, something like prophylaxis, that synovial lining may shrink if the bleeding stops, but it never actually goes away completely. It can be removed surgically and oftentimes this is done um, in someone who has a big swollen boggy knee like this um, 
person here in the picture um, because that big boggy knee impedes or changes how they can flex and bend their knee. So um, next slide, please. We could do a whole talk on surgery, but we're not gonna do that tonight. Um, so this is, um, I love these pictures. They came from the World Federation of Hemophilia. They have a, a pictorial um, guide to bleeding disorders um, that can be used in any country with any language. And this just shows what happens when someone develops that hemophilic arthropathy or arthritis. Initially, they have bleeds into the joint. And as they bleed repetitively into the joint, um, the blood stays in the joint longer. The body knows that blood doesn't belong in our joints. So it secretes these, what we call proteolytic enzymes. And they're like little Pac-Men. They go in and they eat up the blood that's in there. But unfortunately, they're not discriminatory and they start to eat up the cartilage too. So you can see in that panel on the right side of the slide that that cartilage is no longer smooth and white like it is in the first panel. It's all ratty and chewed up now. And as that cartilage wears away, you get bone on bone and that causes the arthritic pain that our patients with bleeding disorders feel. Next slide, please. So what do we do? How do we evaluate um, patients who have joint disease. And we're becoming more and more, um, I don't know if we, I wanna say more and more better, but we're using more tools than we did ever have in the past. So we're looking at physical therapy. Um, a good physical therapist doesn't need x-rays or MRI. They can really tell subtle changes. Um, I was lucky enough to work with one of those physical therapists and she taught me a lot about evaluating joints just by simply looking at the patient, watching them walk. Um, so a physical therapist is very important. We'll talk a little more about that. X-rays and radiographs, um, MRIs, and then the latest um, thing that has joined our um, armatarium of ways to evaluate joint bleeding is point of care ultrasound. Next slide. So as I said, our physical therapist um, at your HTC or in the community, um, many physical therapists will have um, liaisons with physical therapists in the community that have worked with patients with bleeding disorders, but they um, work with the patient when they're having a bleed. They help follow the bleed, um, develop a rehab program for the patient so that they can get back to their baseline. Um, they monitor joints over time. For those of you who do go to comprehensive clinic visits, they're the people who are in there with that funny little thing, that goniometer measuring your joints and watching you walk and um, assessing your strength and your motion in your joints. And that's really important because with Today, with all the wonderful treatment we have, um, the changes that we see in joints can be very subtle. And so we need to monitor those changes over time. And that's where our physical therapist comes in. They're also a um, very good resource for helping guide exercise programs. Um, if you want to start a new sport, um, the physical therapist at the treatment center is a great person to call and pick their brain about what kinds of things you need to do, what kinds of special equipment you might need, um, what kind of safety things you need to put into practice. And um, they can also help adapt equipment if um, need be. So um, I remember we had an adult patient who um, had difficulty riding bikes, but his family was very, very active um, riding mountain bikes here in Colorado. And um, our PT was able to help adapt a bicycle for him so that this was before the electric bicycles. Now, I think it's that's a great thing that we have that we can offer our patients is um, the ability to um, ride an exercise or ride an electric bicycle. Um, so they can still do those kinds of activities with their families. Next slide, please. Um, this is just an example of x-rays. Um, you can see on the left-hand side, that's a normal x-ray of someone who does not have a bleeding disorder. And then on the right-hand side is um, 
someone who has end-stage hemophilic arthropathy. So you can see that nice space in between the femur and the tibia, the upper and lower bones, is no longer present. It's just a thin line. And even on the um, left-hand side, I can't point. So I'll see if Natalia can point to um, the left the right hand slide, the right hand picture, but the left, that area right in there, you can see there's an area where there's almost bone on bone. So, um, and this would be very painful for someone. Um, they may not currently be bleeding. They may have burned out that synovium and they may not be actively bleeding into that joint, but they still have the arthritic change that causes significant pain. Next slide, please. And this is an example of an MRI. This is a 10 year old. Um, see all that black stuff in there? That is that proliferative hemosiderin laden synovium. Hemosiderin is just a fancy name for iron deposits that are left behind after bleeding takes place, but um, it stains the um, synovial lining. So it gives us an opportunity um, on an MRI to see that hypertrophied synovium. So we can see that um, swelling um, that you saw back when we were looking at the, um, that kiddo with the, the big synovitis. Next slide, please. And then um, ultrasound or ultrasonography has really um, come into being in the last five years um, to help us with the evaluation of joint bleeds. Um, many hemophilia treatment centers are doing it in the clinic. Um, they have um, purchased or rented ultrasound machines and either the physical therapist or the hematologist has been trained on how to use these to evaluate joint bleeding. Um, it's much lower cost and can be done right there in the clinic than sending someone for x-rays or radiographs. Um, it doesn't require sedation in young children. Um, as I said, it can be used in an acute care setting, but it does have some limitations. Um, the person who's doing it needs to be well-trained and they need to do it often. Um, and we can't really evaluate deep structures. So we, we can see blood on an ultrasound in a joint or in the soft tissues, but um, it's a little more difficult to, it's not a good tool to evaluate arthritic changes. So if we wanna look at the changes in the bone and the cartilage, we're more likely gonna use an MRI or an X-ray. Next slide, please. So um, what if you already have some chronic issues? You've had some joint disease in the past. Um, consider prophylaxis. Um, if you don't have that end stage bone on bone, by doing prophylaxis, you can, um, slow the progression. You're never gonna stop the prog progression of those arthritic changes, but by preventing repetitive bleeding, you can actually slow those. Um, I think it was a very hard concept for some of our adult patients to, to say, well, why would I start prophylaxis now? I'm, I'm 50 years old. But really, um, unless you have already had joint replacements or have that bone on bone, you can prevent by doing prophylaxis, um, not necessarily prevent, but slow the progression of that joint disease. Um, and then again, turning to the physical therapist, they can help you get the most out of the joints you have. So um, they can give you strengthening exercise programs for particular joints. And like I said before, there are a wealth of knowledge in helping you get hooked up with um, different exercise programs out in the community. And by doing these things with physical therapy, you can actually um, improve range of motion and strength. And I've seen, especially with some of our inhibitor patients who um, are have gone on um, emesismab and who are no longer bleeding, um, I've seen them really work with a physical therapist and regain some of the motion that they had lost when they were bleeding all the time. Next slide, please. Um, there are non-invasive things that we can do for our patients. Um, with who already have some, some chronic issues. Um, they can be over-the-counter med medications or supplements. Um, and we can talk about those if you have questions at the end. Um, there are prescription medications that can be prescribed. Um, 
but you always want to check with your healthcare provider before starting any new medication. So you meet um, John Doe at the gym and he says, hey, I've been taking this supplement and it's really good and I've been getting stronger and stronger since I've been taking it. It may be fine for you to take with a bleeding disorder. Just give your HTC a call, run it by them, make sure it doesn't have anything in it that could potentiate bleeding. And then um, there are surgical or invasive options. Um, as I said before, when we were looking at that big boggy knee, um, you can go in and remove that synovial lining. That's called a synovectomy. Um, it's usually done early in, in the course of joint disease before we have that ar those arthritic changes, that bone on bone change. Um, once you have that bone on bone change, um, total joint replacement has been very effective. Um, the PT I worked with, she and I were talking not too long ago, and we were reminiscing about the very first total joint replacement that was done in one of our hemophilia patients was done in 1978, and he still has that joint in. So um, these can be very effective, very um, well tolerated procedures in our patients that offer an increase in range of motion and a decrease in pain. And then there are other um, surgical procedures that can be done on patients with bleeding disorders. Um, some are more minor, some are more major. Um, like I said before, we could do a whole talk on surgical procedures. Next slide, please. So um, what can we do to save joints? Well, we can prevent bleeds. So um, if you're already on prophylaxis, maintain your prophy schedule. Stay physically active. Um, take a walk, ride a bike, go for a swim. Um, and you really want to try to do things that can um, help you help yourself. So um, simple, healthy steps. Drinking a glass of water instead of a diet soda. Um, for those who are concerned about weight loss, a lot of us go to those diet sodas and um, those are very laden with chemicals. Not to say I don't imbibe in a Diet Coke every once in a while, but um, a glass of water um, certainly is more healthy for us. Um, snacking on fruits and vegetables. And looking at trying to maintain a healthy weight. When we're overweight, um, it's, it puts more stress and strain on our joints, whether you have hemophilia or you don't have hemophilia. Um, and an interesting fact is 40 2.4% of US adults are obese and 21.2% of children and teens. So that's dramatic when you think about it. Next slide, please. So this is just, you can find your state here. Um, this is as of 2020, this is self-reported obesity among US adults by state. And um, this is published um, by the CDC. So you can see um, where you are, where your state lands in um, this. And, um, you know, the, the West and the New England states tend to be um, better when it comes to obesity. I think it's because patients or people who reside in those states tend to be more physically active outdoors. Um, but it's just food for thought. We want to change this. We want everybody to be green. We don't want um, to see people with those orange and burgundy um, colors in their state. We, we really want to strive to, and not only just for, like I said, for those patients with bleeding disorders, it makes a tremendous difference um, on your joints, but for the rest of us as well. Next slide, please. So in summary, um, recognizing the bleed, the signs of bleeding so that you can treat early is very important. We want to prevent bleeds. And if you already have some chronic damage, you want to maintain um, your prescribed um, treatment regimen. So if you're on Profi, stay on Profi. Um, try to stay as physically active. Use the resources you have, the Hemophilia Treatment Center physical therapist. Um, and try as best you can to maintain a healthy weight. I know we're all gained a bunch of weight in the last two years with COVID. Um, hemophilia, von Willebrand's, non-bleeding disorder people, we all gained that weight. And now we're all tr 
trying to get back to a, um, a healthier weight. Um, but take it slow. Um, crash dieting is not the way to go. And talk to your health care healthcare provider about your joint health and um, any questions you may have. Um, they, they know you better than anybody else in terms of um, your, your bleeding disorder and they're really your go-to person. Next slide. So we have a couple of case scenarios that we're gonna look at here. And if you would like, I'm just gonna remind you to go to that Mentimeter and um, go ahead and type into that. Um, if you don't want to type in a response, that's fine as well. Um, I'm going to give you my commentary on it after we give people a chance to um, respond. So next slide, please. So someone tells you, I already have a target joint, so I shouldn't be physically active or it will only get worse. So what do you think? What would you tell this person? And if we go to the next slide, we can um, see your responses if you type them in. Okay, Priscilla says no. Um, you want to go back to go, can you go back one slide? So someone tells you they already have a target joint and they, sh and they say, I already have a target joint, so I shouldn't be physically active or it'll only get worse. Tell me, will it, will it only get worse? Um, great response, Naomi, starting with mild exercise and then gradually building up. I'm not sure why these are not showing up in the, the Mentimeter, but um, anybody else want to respond? You could just type it in the chat if you want to. Okay, well, I will tell you what, as a healthcare provider for this patient, we would tell them exactly what um, Naomi did. Um, we would say, Let's talk with a physical therapist. Let's find out what you have going on. And um, then let's start with some mild exercise. Um, Jane says, maintaining what you have is important and to build muscle, exactly. Um, it's a misnomer if people People oftentimes think if they don't do anything, they're really protecting their joints. But in fact, the more active you are and the more muscle, as Jane says, you build up around that joint, the more stable that joint is and the less likely it is to bleed. Okay, we'll move on to the next scenario. Okay, so here we go. My child has a, had a bleed last night. And this is it. Uh, easy one. You all should get this. But his regular profi dose was scheduled for the next morning, so I just waited to infuse. Should they wait till the next morning? Oh, good answer, Naomi. Do not wait. Exactly. Um, we used to hear this a lot, especially in the early days of prophylaxis. Um, patients would say, oh, well, I didn't I didn't go ahead and infuse him because he was supposed to get his profi dose the next day. But if you think about it, um, think back to those that early slide I showed you from, from WFH where the blood gets in and gets in and gets in um, to the joint. Um, yep, Jane says she was trained to try to get the infusion dose in with within one hour. We say two hours out here because we have a little bit bigger distance for patients to get from point A to point B. So if they're somewhere um, away from their home, it may take them longer to get there. But anyway, one hour, two hours. But Jane's right. We should be treating right away, not waiting for that joint to fill with blood all night and then get up. The bleed will, will be significantly worse in the morning and um, will take much longer for it to resolve. Next slide. Someone tells you, I already have a target joint, so the damage is done. There's nothing 
that can be done to prevent more bleeding now? What would you tell this person? Next slide. We'll see if Mentimeter works this time, or if you just want to, you know, type into the chat, that's fine as well. PT, great answer, Naomi. You can, as I said before, um, there's a lot that can be achieved with physical therapy. Um, somebody else typed in, plenty can be done. Um, some, uh, Priscilla says it can still be improved. You bet. And giving up, um, I think those people who grow up in a family where there are older people with bleeding disorders, when we didn't have access to hemophilia treatment centers, when if you think about it, hemophilia treatment centers really only came on the scene in the late 1970s. So they've only been around for a, a little over 40 years. Um, so if you have someone in your family who is older, um, older than 40, they didn't have access to prophylaxis. They didn't have access to physical therapy. So their mindset may be that, oh, what the damage is done. I can't do anything else. But really today we have so much to offer our patients that um, I hate to hear patients say, oh, I can't do, I'm not going to do this. I can't do this because there are things that we can do to help them today. Next slide, please. Someone tells you, and this is especially important for our patients with mild hemophilia or von Willebrand's disease, not only patients who have been on Prophy, but someone tells you, I've been on Prophy and I've never had any bleeds, but now I have an arthritic joint and don't understand why. Anybody want to venture a guess why? Next slide. Um, somebody said, I'm at that point in life because I was undiagnosed. Um, there, is, there is natural arthritis. Naomi mentioned that. So for those of us who don't have bleeding disorders, as we get older, um, the natural wear and tear on our joints can cause arthritis. Um, but our patients with mild disease or those patients who are on prophylaxis, and this was proved out even in the joint outcome study um, that Dr. Manko Johnson did with our very young children, um, we saw that even patients who were on prophylaxis who followed that regimen exactly still ended up with some subtle changes on MRIs. Um, so, we know that microbleeding probably takes place and we try to do the best we can to prevent that microbleeding, but we're not gonna prevent it. And that just that little bit of blood in the joint can act as, um, and, and excuse me, as an irritant and cause a little bit of disease or accelerate that arthritic process. Next slide, please. I think this might be our last one. Um, my child fell and I wasn't sure if it was a sprain or a break or a bleed. What would you tell this person? Next slide. Oh, come on, somebody wants to tell this person something. Call your HTC, good response. Treat anyway, bingo, Naomi. It wouldn't hurt. I always try to help patients understand um, and parents that they have a bleeding disorder or your child has a bleeding disorder. By giving factor, all you're doing is bringing your child up to the same level as someone who's not affected with a bleeding disorder. So you're not going to hurt them by giving factor, even if it turns out that it wasn't a bleed. Um, and Priscilla says, when in doubt, treat. Exactly. You need to treat those bleeding episodes um, or suspected bleeding episodes when the trauma happens, not wait until to see if 
what an x-ray shows or whatever. And then oftentimes what happens is when you go in, say, you know, these things happen, they never happen on a weekday at one in the afternoon. They happen at seven o'clock on Friday night. So um, by the time you go to the emergency room and get x-rays, we've, we at our treatment center, and I'm sure most of you were taught this as well, you want to treat before you evaluate. So even if you're not sure if it's a bleed, go ahead and treat it and then have the evaluation. Naomi says every holiday. Did you have a, did your son have a bleed on Thanksgiving, Naomi? <laughs> um, so um, next slide. With that, I'm going to end, and we do have an evaluation that you all need to do. So, um, next slide, please. Ah, she says when he was younger. Um, these are all of our sponsors that help put this presentation um, together, or we put the NHF put the presentation together, but it was with support from these. Um, Jane says, "Yep, yeah, on Friday evenings." I know. I I used to hate coming in on Monday morning to hear all the things that happened over the weekend, because, you know, I wish as treatment centers, we can't, could be on call 24 seven for our patients, but that doesn't, it doesn't happen that way. There's someone on call, but it's not necessarily the person who knows you or knows hemophilia. So um, as an Italian is telling us, if you could fill out the evaluation in Mentimeter, um, we would appreciate it. And, um, I'm gonna leave this up for just a second if you guys would um, log back into Mentimeter. And uh, I think Natalia has it in the comments how to get in. And you can also see it at the top of the screen. Um, it doesn't seem that Mentimeter is working that great tonight. So um, let me just give it another minute. Ah, there we go. Great. Um, good. I'm glad people learned something new um, and I'm glad it was relevant. And um, I hope that I, my, my goal for doing these talks is that everyone take away one new piece of information. So I, I hope that that happened. Um, can we go to the next slide? This is the next question in the evaluation. Um, so um, NHF would like to know um, what your main takeaway from today's presentation is. Again, if it's not working in Mentimeter, you can put it in the comments, but if you can get into the Mentimeter, again, we would appreciate that. Yeah, make joint health a priority. That's so important. Oh, Priscilla, thank you. I wish I wish it would have been available to you too when your son was growing up. It, it really is, um, you can see a big dichotomy in what our older patients experienced and what our younger patients are. And I'm very happy for myself that I've lived through those changes. My entry into hemophilia was through orthopedics. And I had met a lot of my adult or, the, or adult hemophilia patients, not as the hemophilia nurse, I worked on the ortho floor. And here were these 20 and 30 year olds coming in to have total joint replacements. And I had never seen anybody that had had um, a total joint replacement at that young age. And I worked in an orthopedic hospital in North Carolina for three years. And never once did I ever see a young person like that. So um, I hope today that um, your children um, don't go on to need total joint replacements when they're in their 20s or 30s. I hope they can make it till their 60s and 70s, just like the rest of us. Um, 
And we have one last question and this will not populate. We won't see the answers, but um, if you would like to share any additional comments, um, please um, go ahead and type those into Mentimeter now. And while you're thinking about that, I have a joke. How do locomotives know where to go? Think about that. I used to have a patient and every time he came in, he's now in high school. I saw him at our walk this year, but every time he came in, he always had a joke for me. So now I always feel like I have to be prepared for a joke with a joke. Okay, it's because they had a lot of training. Uh -huh. So anyway, um, next slide. And with that, um, if anybody does have a question, um, certainly feel free to type it um, into um, the chat and I will try to answer it and we'll hang out here for a couple minutes and if no one has any questions um then we'll say good night but i will hang here for a couple minutes if you have a question i never know how long the lag time is between people when they type and put stuff into a chat sometime i'm going to time it Thank you, Jane. Okay, well, on behalf of NHF, um, oh. wait, Sue, it looks like you have one in here. Yeah. From Naomi. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, there are soft tissue bleeds that do require treatment. And oftentimes the soft tissue bleeds, um, we decide whether or not to treat those soft tissue bleeds based on their location. So um, if they're in and around the joint, even though we don't think the joint is bleeding, if it's gonna impede range of motion or how a patient is walking or using their arm, then we wanna go ahead and treat. Um, we're, we really don't want patients, even with some soft tissue bleeds, to experience the pain that soft tissue bleeding can cause. Um, any other questions? or comments. Okay, well, with that, we'll close. Um, I will thank you guys for um, sticking with us with this small group this evening. Um, like I said, I hope everyone um, got one new thing out of this and that um, NHF is there to support you guys. Um, and um, I think we owe them a big thank you for um, sponsoring things like this and as well as those sponsors that we showed you on the slide. So with that, I'll say good night. And I hope you guys have, uh, if you're Jewish and celebrating the second night of Hanukkah, I think it's the second night, might be the third night now, third night, sorry, third night. Hey, I was close. Um, <laughs> Third night of Hanukkah, and for those of you who are getting ready for this holiday season, I wish you all the best, um, and happy holidays. Thanks, and have a good night. Thank you. Have a good night.